Hey guys, thanks for joining me this week. I really, really appreciate you guys. Faithfulness week after week to meet me here. Uh, I know I'm wearing a jacket. It's summertime, weird, but you know, whatever. Hell, I'm just chilly by nature. I can't help it. Uh, but hey, listen, we've got a lot to cover tonight. Let me pray for us and then we'll jump right into it. Lord, thank you so much for my brothers and sisters. Thank you, God, for their faithfulness to this study. Lord, as we are continually refining who we are in Christ, our desire to be true followers. Lord, I thank you so much for the work you're doing, what you have done already through this study, and the way you've certainly dealt with my heart. And Lord, I've heard many, uh, many reports from others and how you're working in there. So Lord, I do pray that you'd be in our study tonight. Lord, pray that you'll just help me to get out of the way. Lord, communicate what it is you want us to hear, the way you want us to hear it. Uh, Lord, help us have ears to hear, and Lord, hearts that can receive truth, uh, Lord, that maybe we can look within ourselves and be a, a little bit more Christ-like tomorrow than we are today. Lord, I thank you so much for this gift of time. Thank you for the technology that we have to reach out, and I pray, God, that you'll keep my brothers and sisters safe, bless them, and Lord, use them in this week to come, and Lord, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, we are walking uh, continually in our study of what it means to be a true follower of Christ, right? A true follower of Christ. The world would call them a Christian, right? Uh, a Christian. We want to be Christians. And in, 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 in Acts eleven twenty six, we hear this in, in the word of God. It says, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year after they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So here, as the church is continually forming and as it's expanding, what's happening is they're implementing the instructions of the Lord. As Christ ascended, he gave instructions in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. He said this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So what are they doing, right? What are these, these Christians, what are they doing? They are reaching the lost. They are baptizing them. And then they're doing what we talk about all the time. They're discipling them. They're doing what the Lord the Lord did with them. He discipled them. They're discipling these others so that they can then do the same for others. The whole purpose of this is reproducing. It's about reproducing Christians. But while this process is taking place, there were people that were detractors, those that were ridiculing the apostles, that were ridiculing these disciples of Christ. And the term that they used to make fun of them was, in fact, Christians. So when they were using that term, it wasn't a positive. It was a derogatory term used to make fun of them as followers of Christ. Christian really means to be Christ-like. We might more directly translate it like this, to be little Christ, to be a, to be a little Christ. But what started as um, really a way of making fun, <laughs> making fun of these peculiar people who, by the way, were expressing, you know, they're expressing love and forgiveness and kindness and grace in spite of the way they were being treated by others. They were, they were unusual, as the scripture of God tells us, were to be peculiar people. Well, they were peculiar. And what started out as a way of making fun of them soon was worn by them as a label of honor as they were recognized as followers. So a Christian is someone who literally just reflects the traits that Christ would have been known for. Okay, that's what that's what's being seen. So it isn't a title that's to be claimed by those who are born again. Because recognize that Christian does not mean saved. Okay? Christian does not mean saved. We use it that way, but that's actually not what it means. Understand, no, it's it's not a title. Um, it's a title actually that's that's not gained on our own. We don't select it or we don't choose it. It's one that's earned through a faithful walk with God. That's the whole thing. Can I tell you this? That since I have been saved, I've not always been a Christian. No. Newsflash. There have been things that I have done in my life that I'm telling you the Lord would never do. 
Never. And I did them not once, but sometimes twice, two, three, four times. There have been things in my life that I've done that I have great regret. And you know what? I hazard to guess that I'm not the only one. That maybe some of you guys, since you've been saved, have not always been, not always been Christians. There are things that maybe that we've done collectively that we live with regrets. Well, listen, we cannot change our past, okay? We can't change our past. There's nothing we can do. But what we can do is we can certainly correct our future. That's the desire we have to have. We're pressing towards the mark. As Paul described it, as he talked about the regrets of his life in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Look, I've not arrived in my Christian life, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And he had much to be sorry for and have regret over. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark. I press towards the finish line for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm up trying to attain that life as a Christian, a picture of Christ. Listen, guys, our focus must be on who we can become, not on who we were. As we're working on this aspect of being a true follower, we've got to re re recognize and give ourselves a past and recognize that we can't change our past. We failed in the past. Yes, we failed the Lord. Yes, we may not have always been Christians, but every day we must strive to do better. This is why this study is so important. It's why it's so crucial if we're to become true followers of Christ. And that must be our desire. So as we continue focusing on these elements in our life and our human experience that separate us from the Lord, right? We see these divisive things in our faith that are all under this title, works of the flesh, the works of the flesh. And this is what we've been going through for, for weeks now. So last week, we addressed the sin of envy. Now, this is the desire to have something that, that someone else has. This is, we see something, and man, we, it just burns within us. And understand, if dealt with, if not dealt with biblically, what will happen is envy will, in fact, turn itself into emulation. We saw that also in our list. Emulation is where we take something, this desire, it's only a desire. What happens is emulation means we start to take action. We start to actually do things in order to get what it is that we desire. And then when emulation manifests itself, it actually becomes idolatry, which is where this thing that we once desired to possess now takes a preeminence in our life and starts to control. It actually becomes like, like a God to us. This can be a person. This can be a position this can be a possession, right? It's, it's dangerous. But before it gets that far, what happens is we have to start to deal with the emotional desire to have. And this envy, which we talked about last week, is all linked and rooted in discontentment and dissatisfaction. The very things that Satan preyed upon Eve with, a sense of discontentment and dissatisfaction. Also, which we found out last week, they're always linked to feelings of anger and of hatred, which invariably end up in division. We talked about the danger of division in the church. Now, how can I be unified? Listen, with someone that I actually have resentment towards, we can look at that understanding of what envy is and recognize the fact that, of course, it's going to cause division because we can't. When I feel resentment towards somebody, it's going to naturally cause distance between us. God's desire always is that we are contented, that we have contentment in our lives. Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So content is to be is to find peace, right? To find peace where we are. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and 7 says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain, right? So godliness goes hand in hand with contentment, meaning that discontentment goes hand in hand with ungodliness. And then 1 Timothy continues, he says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And yet we fight and scratch and dig and claw all that we can to get all that we possibly can for ourselves before we die. 
only to leave it all behind because we take nothing with us. And then we're standing in the judgment seat of Christ. Imagine we spend all of our time trying to get things of the world for ourselves and then we, we leave them all behind. So we stand before the Lord with nothing to show for the life that he gave us because we didn't live as a Christian. We just claimed the title instead of earning it. We claim the title instead of earning it. Guys, that's why this, this whole study is so important. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? It means that you're a Christian. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to attain. We want to be Christians. And listen, I don't want us to live lives as Christian by title because we're living in lives of hypocrisy. No. My prayer and my desire for us as a church and as individuals would be that we were true, that we were real, that we were true followers, that we were true Christians who don't worry about claiming the title because we're just too busy living it. And then just like those men and women in Antioch, instead of telling someone we're a Christian, it'll be a title that we'll receive from people that watch our lives. And they'll be the ones that'll label us. So tonight, as we continue dealing with these things in our lives, these sinful characteristics of the flesh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to tackle murders. Murders, okay? And this one, we go, oh, this, this should be simple. And, you know, this is actually going to be a two-parter tonight um, because we're going to have to go into some pretty um, technical stuff as we sort of talk about and address this. But Galatians 5, 16 through 21 is where this study comes from. We talk about the works of the flesh. It says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's our end desire to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are the contrary, the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, we did last week, tonight, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And all those ones we listed before this, they've all been covered in previous um, episodes or, or studies, so you want to go back and watch those to learn about them. So right off the bat, we think, well, man, this is this is pretty self-explanatory, right? <laughs> this is a sin that I, I'm prayerful that a majority of us have not dealt with. We're not uh, struggling with the fact that this is one that we have committed. Um, but listen to what God says about taking human life. Exodus 20, 13 says this, is from the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. And we know he's referencing human life. When we get to Leviticus 24, 17, he qualifies here. He says, and he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. We can see how seriously, man, the Lord deals with and takes this aspect of taking a human life. Leviticus here is telling us that a person who consciously makes this choice, right? This is someone who premeditatedly decides to go kill somebody. They make a decision on their own. It's not an accident, right? This person's life should be given. They should lose their life for taking the life of someone else. Recognize this is an act of hatred. This is an act that's fueled by the flesh. And it is contrary to the heart of God. God is a God of love. What we all got to understand while at the same time, God, yes, loves us, and he absolutely does more than we can possibly understand what love truly is. But at the same time, because God loves us, guess what he also does? He holds us accountable. He holds us accountable. And he has consistent accountability upon godliness, godlessness. God judges godless behavior, things that are contrary to his will and his desire, sin, right? When sin, what does sin mean? Sin means to miss the mark. When an archer would fire at a target, right? If he hit the mark, the bullseye, hey, great. But if he were to miss the mark he was shooting for, it was called a sin. So to sin means to miss the mark. So we're missing the mark of what God's called us to be. When we sin, we're doing things that are outside of God's will. Now, there are two sins in the Old Testament that could not be atoned for 
by a substitutionary sacrifice, which would mean an animal sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. One of those being murder. And the penalty for murder was death. The only way to atone for a human life was with another human life, okay? In the Old Testament, we see that those who were kill, who those who killed others would in fact be killed as a result of being found guilty, okay? Notice Numbers 35, verses 30 and 31. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die, okay? We know it has to be, the, the truth had to be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So they had, couldn't be just one. One person said he was the one. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they would not be found guilty. They'd still address them. They'd still uh, put them out of the city and they'd have to go to a place of safety. But understand, they, were, they weren't to be killed. God's justice, now understand, once they're found guilty is a life for a life. It continues in verse 31. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. What God's telling us there is that, look, um, this is not about their murderer's accountability to mankind. It's not, in fact, even the murderer's accountability to the victim. When he says there, take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, what he's saying is the fact that this is about the murderer's accountability to God, okay? This is not about his accountability to humanity, but about his accountability to God. God is the creator of life, okay? He created us, and because of that, he is the only one who has the right to take it, okay? To give you an example, okay? My wife and I this year, for, this is our first real time ever really trying to be gardeners or whatever, you know, planting things and stuff like that. So we kind of nuked our front area, right? We got rid of all the bushes and all that kind of stuff like that. And man, we went out there and we cleaned and weeded and did all this work. And we planted all these bulbs and all these flowers and all these plants. And we did all this work, man. Worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And day after day, you could have come by our home and you'd look at there and say, man, they're really out there in the heat. And they're just, they're working so hard to get that thing done. And if we come home one day and you've decided to come over to our house and what you're doing is you're ripping up all the plants and you're putting them in a pile and you're burning them. Not cool, by the way. Not cool. <laughs> we wouldn't take very kindly to that. You have no right to come into our yard and take our garden that we put the time and energy into it and destroy those plants. But if Christine and I decide, you know what? We're going to start over again. And you look out the window and you see us out there in the yard and we're ripping up all that stuff, all the effort we put in you. We dig it all up and we throw it in a pile and we burn it. Well, guess what? We're the ones, that's our garden. We have the right to destroy it if we choose. And that's the way it is with human life. God created life and he's the only one who has the right to take it. Understand God's punishment for destroying a life that he created in his image was death. And can I tell you, it's the same standard today. It's the same standard today. God's level of accountability for humanity has not changed. It's still the same standard. A life for a life. A life for a life. Only in the New Testament economy, what we have is the death of Jesus Christ has ushered, has ushered in what's titled and what we call the age of, of grace, where salvation is through faith, where the sacrifice of our Savior brought an atonement for sin, for all sin, to cover any and all sins of humanity. Listen to this in 1 John 2, verses 1 through 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation. Propitiation is a word that means atonement, right? He's the payment for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. If you see, Jesus was the only viable sacrifice for our sins. Because our sin... Recognize our sin, 
Remember, missing the mark, doing things outside of the will of God. Our sin is against the perfect, infinite God. And only a perfect, infinite life could pay our debt to God. What this means for you and I is that only God himself could atone the sin of mankind, of mankind, including murder. Only God himself, an infinite being, could pay the penalty owed to himself. This is the remarkable aspect of the, of the story of Christ. He paid the penalty owed to himself with his own life. This is why God had to become a man. This is why God dwelt among us. 1 John 1.14 says this, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the glory of God displayed in human flesh, full of grace and truth. Right? He came to give his perfect life on our behalf. You see, no other sacrifice would do. There's no other sacrifice that could do what his life could do. And it would be through Christ's atoning work on the cross that even the penalty of murder would be satisfied. As Jesus' sinless, holy, sanctified blood did the impossible and atoned us. And who's, and so those who commit murder, well, guess what? They're still sentenced to death. That's still the case. But you see, the question is, will they pay the debt themselves in an eternal separation from God through a second death, a physical death, and a second death? Or will they repent of their sin, turn their heart, give their life to Christ through earnestly submitting to the Lord and thus be set free from the penalty of their sin. You see, God's accountability for sin, it's not changed. It's the same accountability. But in the age of grace, unbelievably, our loving God offers redemption from sin, even the sin of murder. Now, I know there are probably some people out there that are watching this, or maybe someone sent this to you to, to, to get your opinion or whatever. And to those out there that are saying, okay, okay. So because someone is saved, they can go sin and they can do all that they want and live like the devil and yet get off scot-free. Boy, they've got, you know, I can, I can live a life of debauchery and sinfulness. And because I've got my ticket to heaven in my pocket, I'm pretty much good to go. I don't, I don't need to worry. Hey, man, I got saved. Hey, man, I, I'm good. <laughs> I, I don't need to worry about it. I prayed a prayer. Realize the fact that, guys, does Jesus sacrifice? Does it, does it atone for all sin? Even things like murder? Yes, it does. Even murder. But just because someone went through the religious ceremony or the motions or the whatever it was to say the sinner's prayer, it does not mean that that person is truly saved. It does not mean that they have been redeemed. I want you to listen to the wording here in Romans chapter number 10, verses 9 through 13, okay? Romans 10, verses 9. It says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, okay? Pray. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. We believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the salvation story, that we recognize and understand that Jesus is Christ. We put our faith in him. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Righteousness means sinless. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. We're cleansed, we're, we're saved through, that, through the heart belief. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We're, we're making a public profession. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, right? We're going to, we're, if, if I say I'm saved, man, there's no, I, I, there's no way in the world 
I can be ashamed of what God's done inside of me. I'm going to be proud and bold in speaking the truth of who Christ is and what he's done in my life. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. God doesn't see difference. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse 13. For whosoever, anybody in the whole wide world, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, a promise from God. So what will happen is some people go, oh, yeah, I, I called on the name of the Lord. But you see the qualifiers back there? In verses 9 and 10 about the heart, that is absolutely key. That's absolutely key. It's not the, I mean, some people see it as kind of a, a, a contractual fulfillment where someone has simply said, look, you know what? I'm going to initial in all the right places and I'm going to sign all the right places. I'm going to dot all the I's and I'm going to cross the T's. I'm going to go through and do exactly what this technical thing said that I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to believe in my heart. Sure, I believe. And I'm going to call out with my, with, with my, my voice and I'm going to pray this prayer. Guys, it's not about that. It's not about that at all. Not at all. You see, if that was the case, if it was about just dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure that we said a prayer so that we could go back and say, well, I said the prayer. Listen, that puts the onus on us because what it's simply saying is, look, the prayer is what saved me. No, it's not the prayer. It's the faith in Christ. Listen, what we're thinking in that instance is, look, I did my part. I said a prayer. I said all the right words. And I even had an amen at the end, man. Can I just tell you that you could pray that prayer a thousand times over with the most technically perfect, flowery, amazing language imaginable and still bust hell wide open believing that you're saved? Guys, it's not that. Salvation is not a matter of what we do in regards to, I prayed, so I'm saved. No, it's recognition of the fact that it is 100% Christ and Christ alone. Our faith is in him. It's not about us. It's about him. All we bring is a willingness to believe by faith. That's it. It's not the prayer, it's the heart. I was talking to Jason yesterday in discipleship. I said, look, I believe a lot of people get saved prior to ever even saying a prayer because it's a matter of the heart, man. If we'll submit to the Lord, we recognize who he is. We understand who we are. We're sinful. We are repent in our heart and we turn to God, man. It's that broken heart that he saves us in. And what happens is that prayer is more of almost a formality for many people before they even ever prayed, man. God's already broken their heart and they've already come to that point of contrition where they've received that gift. But listen to what it says in Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 10. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Okay, Here's the reason why Christ went to the cross. Right, His great love wherewith he loved us. It was love. It's love. It's love. It's love. God loves us in spite of ourselves. Even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. So even in the midst of our sinful life, in the midst of our murderous mindset, in the midst of our selfish, destructive, sensual, lustful hearts, hath quickened us. It says, even when we were dead in sins, when we were in the midst of that garbage, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We could experience this walk with God. For by grace are you saved through faith, okay? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, not a, not a prayer, lest any man should boast. But hey, I said the prayer, but I said the prayer. No, what's your heart? Not by works, lest any man should boast. For we, listen to this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, right? Created in Christ Jesus, brought to life through the power of God, the same resurrection power that brought him out of the tomb, the same power worked in us unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We, God said, look, when you receive Christ, it was already determined. What happens is the spirit of God moves within you. And look, it's already, we, God knew this of us, that when we receive Christ, we would then start to walk with him. We weren't going to be perfect at it, but that was the desire. God starts to guide and direct our lives. 
Guys, when we are truly saved, the Spirit of God takes up residence within our hearts. He becomes a part of us. And it's through this new life in Christ that we're to live. Now, unfortunately, I still live in a body of flesh. But listen to what he said there back in verse 10. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God created us for that purpose, that we would walk in them, in this love and light and goodness of God. Verse 10 started with this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not unto sin. But we struggle with this flesh because our spirit is saved, man. I've received, the, I've received the Holy Ghost, man. The Holy Spirit of God has come with inside of me. And what happens now? I'm saved, but I'm still stuck in this stupid body that's tied to this world. And it's not until we cut ties with this thing and this corporeal form is dead that we have a glorified body that will be set free from that. So every day, what are we doing? We're refining our walk with God. We're trying to kill off these aspects of the flesh. That's why we're dealing with these things. That's why we're addressing them one by one so that we can look at ourselves and we can refine our walk. And when we see them in our life, we try to deal with them. We bring them to the Lord and we put them at the altar of God. We sacrifice ourselves daily. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, I don't believe that someone who's claiming that they are saved, listen, who's living a life without remorse or regret can truly be a born again child of God. Some of you may want to argue that point with me, but I do not see how it is possible for someone who claims to be a Christian, who claims to be born again, who claims to be saved, who lives in a life of sin and does not experience regret and remorse in their sin. It does not line up with what the Bible says. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12 verses 6 and 8 as God defines this for us. Listen, for whom the Lord loveth his children, those that have received Christ, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he hath, notice this wording, whom he hath receiveth. Those that he's received, right? He's received them. They are born again. If ye endure chastening, okay? Chastening is the power of God working in our life to draw us to goodness when we're in the midst of something we should not be doing. God dealeth with us, dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? What kind of father, if he loves his son, wouldn't correct him, wouldn't try to straighten him out, wouldn't try to bring him out of something he shouldn't be involved in? That's what God's saying. Listen to this verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, meaning you have no remorse, you have no regret. You don't feel the reproof of the Spirit of God. You don't feel God calling you and trying to draw you to do right and pull you out of what's wrong. You don't feel that. There's nothing there. Whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're not saved. You're not saved. I don't care what ceremony you went through or what prayer you said. If you did not mean it with your heart and you were not sincere with God, don't fool yourself into believing you're a child of God. Because guess what? If you can live in sin and have no remorse and no regret, then by, based upon what it says in Hebrews 12, verses 6 to 8, there's no way you are a child of God. He says you're a bastard and not a son. You are not the son of God. So what does that tell us? Is that if we are living in sin as a child of God, He's going to reprove us because we're his. And the other side of that is those who live in sin, who don't experience conviction, and don't experience reproof, they're not his. So as a child of God, as children of God, we can most certainly sin. But we cannot do it without feeling the reproof of the Lord. We cannot do it without feeling God drawing us to do right. See, the Spirit of God lives within us. And what happens when we expose the Spirit of God to sin is that he churns within us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And what happens? The Bible talks about the fact of grieving the Spirit. Ephesians 4, verses 30 through 32. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't put the Holy Spirit of God in experiences where God's not going to be pleased he's going to grieve whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption man we're saved for eternity and what happens is that spirit's within you guess what he'll do he'll respond to our sinful acts how do we grieve the spirit of god paul tells us verse 31 let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice 
Listen, the things that you do is you're just living your daily life and you're letting all this flesh just pour out of you. Look, man, hey, put the way for these things. Put them away and be ye kind one to another, okay? So here's the opposite end. He says what not to do. He says, here, look, I'm gonna show you the things to do, which will also tell you what you shouldn't be doing. Be kind to one another. It means we're not hateful. We're not evil. We're not, we're not destructive. We're not a murderer. We're tenderhearted, forgiving one another, not carrying grudges, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What an incredible example of forgiveness we've been given with the Lord. He's saying live godly. Okay, so we see how seriously God takes murder, but hey, it's covered, right? It's, it's covered. And yes, it is covered in eternity. If you've truly received Christ, right? The sacrifice of Christ, well, it does. It does cover that sin. But understand, there are still consequences on earth. As we mentioned last week, as we talked about the fact of the redemptive power of God, sin is sin. Yes, in God's eyes, sin is sin. But from an earthly perspective, from this place, different sins have different consequences. Okay, listen to this Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. All right, don't fool yourself. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay, so for living in fleshly sinful things, guess what? That's going to, the result of that's going to come back into our life. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, sowing and reaping. He soweth to his flesh. We do things that are carnal. Guess what? The result is going to come back to us. The more severe the sin, the more severe the corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. It's one or the other. So now we read this and we think, man, okay, so God's only talking about eternity. No, he is talking about eternity, yes, but at the same time, he's also talking about our personal responsibility in this life. Recognize this, Romans 13, 1 says this, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, okay? He's talking about the government, the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be, those that are in the world, those that are authority over us. Notice the last part. Are ordained of God. Pointing to the fact that earthly authorities, guess what? We're supposed to answer to them. Because as we do answer to them, they have power recognized that's given to them by the Lord. God allows them. So when we answer to them, we are in fact doing so according to God's will. According to God's will. When Jesus was asked about paying tribute or paying taxes to Rome, being accountable to authorities in government, listen to what he said in Matthew twenty two twenty one. They say unto him, Caesar, Caesar's talking about the coin. He talks about whose face is on it. Then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. He said, look, if you're required to pay tax, pay tax. Fall under the authority of the subject or of the, of the of the authorities in in the government, those that have authority over you, meaning that if someone does commit a murder, guess what? They are accountable to the punishment that the earthly authorities would deem appropriate to them. They might be forgiven in the eyes of God, but they still have to pay the consequences. Remember, the greater the sin, the greater consequence on earth. And next week, what we're going to do because we're we're done for tonight, basically, I'm going to wrap it up. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to finish this subject of murders. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from an interesting point of view in 1 John 3.15. He says this, 1 John 3.15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So tonight, what we've done is we've established how serious God is about this thing of murder. And then we see a correlation here between just simply hating our brother and murder. Now, I understand, understand that, or I understand, guys, that you might feel like tonight may have not been so applicable to your life, perhaps. And I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> Hopefully, none of us have had to deal with actual physical murder. But as we explore 1 John 3.15 next week, I think that it's going to change that. It's going to become a little bit more applicable to us as he talks about that aspect of hatred. So if we take nothing out of tonight, please take this. In everything, in all times, in all that we do, we are accountable to God. And my prayer for us as we deal with these issues of the flesh and we work on being a true follower of Christ, 
Let's keep that accountability at the forefront of our hearts and live our lives like we are accountable. Every day, every choice, everything that comes out of our mouth, every thought that crosses our mind, let's live our lives with the mindset that we're accountable to God. Man, he's done so much for us. If you're a born again child of God, you've been given more than you deserve. I've been given so much more than I deserve. And always asking of us is that we live our lives a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. Guys, I love you. I will see you next week as we pick back up on murders. Have a wonderful night. I love you. God bless you. Lord, thank you for tonight, for the gift of time, for the gift of this message, for the gift of my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I do pray that you'll do a work in us. Help us, Lord, to be accountable to you in all aspects of life. And as we recognize and see these things and the works of the flesh, help them never be said of us. Lord, help us, dear Father, to walk, to live, to speak, to think, and react as Christians, that we might truly be followers of the Lord, Christ-like. God, I thank you for today. I pray that you'll bless and guide us through the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you. Thank you so much for giving me this time. I'll see you on Sunday. Bye.